one of Paul's friends, and he mentions his friends typically at the close of his letters. Uh, one of the friends of Christ was a man named Demas. Uh, Demas, his name uh, meant or means in Greek uh, to be popular. So I don't know if he was popular um, or not, but that's what his mother named him. My mom named me Martin, uh, which means warrior. I'm like, are you kidding? Uh, and so I, I guess it applies to a certain degree, does it not? So I think I became a spiritual warrior. Um, but um, his name meant popular, uh, and he was a, a good friend of Paul for many years. Uh, you find him listed in uh, Paul's prison epistles. Uh, during his first imprisonment, Paul uh, was a prolific writer, uh, cared about the churches, and so he wrote them in his imprisonment and had his, uh, his disciples uh, deliver the letters. He, uh, he wrote Colossians and Philemon uh, in prison uh, where he mentions Demas by name in a positive fashion. Um, Colossians was written in the summer of 62, uh, uh, Philemon was written also in the summer of 62. Paul also wrote in prison uh, Ephesians in the summer of 62 AD. And then later he wrote Philippians in 63 AD. Uh, but he mentions Demas in, a, in a, several of those places uh, as a good friend who was with him. Could you imagine hanging with Paul even when he's arrested by the Romans? This would be a dangerous thing uh, for you as an individual. You might lose your job. You could lose your life. You could wind up being imprisoned along with him. Uh, there came per great personal cost to Demas to be befriend Paul and to be there with him. However, when you uh, move forward 67 AD during the Neronian persecutions uh, is when they're going to execute Paul, and Nero does. Uh, and Paul, uh, in prison the second time, uh, lists uh, uh, Demas again uh, in a different kind of light. Uh, his last letter to uh, the church uh, and his last letter to Timothy, Pastor Timothy, uh, he's handing the baton of uh, shepherding off to this young pastor. Uh, and in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 6, Paul writes these words. He says, For I, Timothy, am already being uh, uh, poured out as a drink offering, and at the time of my departure it has now come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. Uh, talk about a way to walk into glory. He said, I've hung, hung close with Jesus all the way to the end. Uh, he says, in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who love his appearing. Amazing. Even in prison, he's encouraging people. What a man, what a man of God. Make every effort, he says in verse 9, to come to me soon. Why? For Demas, his friend, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. I don't know if you've ever had a really good friend of you, yours desert you. Um, I have, uh, my wife and I have, uh, many times. It's a very painful thing. Uh, people that have been with you on vacations, you've gone to their house for game nights, had dinner many times, and then when tough things happen, they leave and desert you. It's a very hard thing. And Paul says, uh, I had a friend like that. His name was Demas. Uh, and when I was in prison for the last time, um, when I needed him to come to me, when I, when I was weak and fragile, and he, I needed a stake on my life, uh, he left me. What was the reason? What did he say? He loved me for this. He left me for this present world. He, he deserted Paul for basically, we could say, materialistic things. Because Thessalonica uh, was uh, the port city of Macedonia. It was on the north uh, end of the Aegean Sea. The Via Ignatia uh, road system ran through Thessalonica. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know if you can see it. It's up in up in that sector here. If you wanted to get to the rest of the Roman Empire, you went by land and eventually by sea uh, through Thessalonica, uh, which meant there's a lot of money here. There's a lot of people here from all over the world. There was a lot of idolatry here because they worshiped anything and everything. So where, where does a, a young man want to place himself so he's in the thick of the action in? Well, he finally realized, man, if I want to re really live life to the fullest, it's, it's not with Paul. It's in Thessalonica. Uh, scholars theorize he might even have been from Thessalonica. He goes, he goes there for all the wrong reasons, for the love of the world, things, the temporal things. Uh, when you analyze why D uh, Demas, and I'm getting to Romans in just a minute, if you're visiting, where's he going with us? Uh, the monkey on the back of Demas, his flesh that he wrestled with, i.e. Romans 7, was the love of the things of the world, the temporal things, eventually got the best of him, and he left Paul over that. I would say that was the monkey on his back. So eventually what happened to Demas was he lost hope. Hope that the eternal is more important than the temporal. I mean, all these things that we have today, they're going by the wayside, are they not? I mean, they're just, you know, they're just temporal things. They're here, they're gone. Uh, what matters is the things in heaven. Uh, and Jesus counseled us to lay up treasures in heaven, uh, not the things on the earth. Demas gave into his flesh, and despite all that Paul had taught him about living a victorious Christian life over the flesh, 
he succumbed to it because I think he lost hope. And once he lost hope, he lost everything. Uh, you might be a Demas type today, a believer, uh, and uh, things of the world might be uh, plaguing you. Your, your old sin nature might be getting the best of you. Uh, and you're at the verge of like losing the joy of your hope. And Paul uh, writes here in the, in the book of Romans chapter 8, uh, beginning with verses 18, moving through verse 30, uh, how to stay hopeful in the fight when you're dealing with the flesh. Because the devil has many tricks in his bag, does he not? One of those is discouragement. If he discourages you and disillusions you, then you lose hope, and you lose hope, you lose the gold mine of walking close with God. So Paul says, I've been down this road. Uh, I personally have uh, fought the flesh all my life. I've, I've fought it all the way to the end successfully, uh, and I have great hope, he says in, in his letter to Timothy, of what lies ahead. Uh, his words are most important. Uh, verses 18 to 30 are quoted by believers many, many times in the middle of a trial, and for good reason, because they're all about hope as you fight the flesh. We want to look at uh, verse 18. Here's what Paul says in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. This is, this is, these are words of hope. Paul says, uh, let, me, let me lay the groundwork for what I'm going to say in the rest of this chapter, which is an awesome section of Scripture, which will take several Sundays to pour through. He says, let me give you the reasons why the believer should be hopeful as you fight the flesh. We want to focus on the first reason, which is articulated in verse uh, 18. The first reason you should be hopeful is, uh, if you s summarize the essence of that verse, it comes down to this. Trials, afflictions, be what they may, lead to triumph. I mean, that's what this verse is all about. This over here leads to this awesomeness over here. Don't forget what lies ahead. Trials, Demas types, lead to triumph. When I was at Dallas Seminary, uh, beginning my education back in 1981 when I was 22, newly married, uh, you know, Liz had never left the state of California, so when we got to, I think it was El Paso, and I'd, I'd been through Texas many times, and we got to El Paso, and she's like, how far is it to to Dallas, uh, not far. <laughs> I think like, it's 590 miles. Am I right? Yeah, I've driven it many times. Uh, and um, so we headed off to Dallas Seminary, and I started taking classes to get my degree in Old Testament. But uh, I took a, a hermeneutics class, which is just a fancy term for Bible study methods, from a Dr. Howard Hendricks, uh, one of the greatest Bible teachers of all time. Uh, and God called him home a few years ago. But um, uh, when I went to this class as a young man, uh, he was teaching his Bible study methods, analysis. Now, bear in mind, I was raised by a federal agent. I get analysis and profiling and all those things that you do as a federal agent. Uh, and, and so I got to class one day, and he, he slaps up this picture on the screen, Dr. Hendricks. Now, how many have seen this? Uh, yeah, you've seen this. Now, when it was given to me back in 80, 81, there was no color. Remember 1980? They're just inventing color, I think, back then. But... <laughs> So uh, there, there's two options here. So how many see the old lady? How many don't see the old lady? Hmm, interesting. Okay, we'll pray for you. Uh, how, how many see the young lady? Okay. How many don't see the, old la the young lady? How many need help? Okay, so I'm going I'm to give you a, like a quick lesson, okay? You with me? You're so quiet. We're a talking church. Yeah, you always talk at the times I say don't talk, and then when... Anyway, so, okay, so uh, the old lady, this is her mouth, this is her nose, and that's her eye. How many just had an aha moment? <laughs> Did you? Yeah. Okay, now the young lady, this is her choker chain, this is her jawline, her left jawline, this is her left earlobe, that's her nose. She's looking that way. Tell me you see her. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Why in the world did the good professor give us this as young students, Bible study methods? He wanted to teach us the power of observation, that when you show up at a, a, you know, a Bible study uh, methods class, you want to learn the power of observation. Do not make assumptions at what you see. Oh, yeah, I've read that verse many times. Uh, really? How, how many times have you actually studied that verse? You know? Do you really know what that verse means? So he wanted to teach us the value of biblical analysis and observation. What do you see? Because what you see at first blush, may, there may be something more than, 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 than what you saw at the first look. Uh, when you look at this, it teaches us the value of perspective. Perspective matters greatly, does it not? So when you face trial, the monkey on your back, you're the Demas type, uh, and you're thinking about you know, not following as hard after Christ as you did because your flesh is getting the best of you, and Paul says, I don't do that. You know, perspective on your trial is everything. And that's what Paul's going to talk about, that trials lead to triumph. That's the perspective. 
He's going to validate that with uh, two subpoints. Uh, and by but with a, this is only a one-point sermon. Do not hyperventilate. And I have no professor here to tell me I can't do it. So it's awesome being an older pastor. So uh, trials lead to triumph. How do I know that? Uh, two reasons. Number one, trials do disclose purposes of God. Do they not? When you sit back, and I just sit back and I thought, in all of my life of walking with God since 1967, when I got saved at nine years old, what have I learned? I mean, about trials. Do you look at the trials and think God's gone off the reservation and forgotten me? No, you learn from them. And I just wrote down the things that I've learned, and these are not exhaustive, but trials always have various purposes. Uh, number one, uh, trials keep you from thinking too much of yourself. I put that first for a good reason. Why? What's at the core of all sin? Pride. And you're like, well, uh, you know, I don't have any problem with pride. <laughs> uh, we need to talk, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, uh, they, thinking too much of yourself. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Paul has a thorn in the flesh, uh, a messenger of Satan that buffets him. Uh, and uh, he, he asks, you know, God, what in the world have I, what do I have this for? And, and the thorn, in my estimation, um, was um, uh, partial blindness from uh, malaria. He contracted in Pamphylia in uh, Southern Asia Minor, which is now modern-day Turkey, on his first missionary trip. Uh, Paul couldn't see very well, not at all. Uh, and, and so he, he, uh, he was prideful, but God tells him in this passage, read it. That because of the great gifts I've given you, Paul, to preach, to teach, to do all you can do, the great mind that you have, I've given you things in your life to lower you down, to humble you, to make you usable. God can't use prideful people. He cannot. Trials help you be uh, humble. Uh, two, uh, trials uh, help you uh, sense and appreciate the bounding grace of God. That's the rest of that chapter, of uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 12, 9 to 10, where uh, God comes to Paul and tells him, uh, my grace is sufficient for you in this suffering. And I've, I've lived to learn the truth of that, that when you are in a point of suffering, be what it is, if it's personal, if it's somebody in your family suffering, that God shows up and teaches you about his great grace for the moment, that it is sufficient. Trials can and should bring glory to God. Remember that uh, we had this sermon back at Christmas, uh, the I am statements of Christ, where Christ said, I am the, the light of the world. Uh, and in John chapter 9, verse 2, where he gives sight to the blind man, the question, see the blind man born from birth, and they ha have the great theological question, Lord, we want to know who sinned, this man or his family? Remember Christ's response? Were you here for that really great sermon by that great pastor? <laughs> yeah. Really? You're not lying? Yeah. Uh, what did Jesus say? Well, he said this guy wasn't born because of his own sin, and his parents didn't sin that he was born this way. Uh, the Father gave him blindness, the Heavenly Father, so that I might come and heal him and give him eyes to validate my, my Messiahship, my deity. See, God's purposes were even in the blindness. Uh, trials bring glory to God when you see his hand in action. Uh, Hebrews 12, 10 uh, Trials burn out the dross of your life, the sin. Uh, read the passage. Whom the Lord loves, he scourges. Every son, no one escapes. If you have children, do you not discipline them? Do you? What would happen if you never disciplined a child? You would have a monster. Yeah, you would. Um, it would be terrible. And so, so when trials come your way, God gets your attention by disciplining you. Don't do that. Don't think that way. Don't act that way. Don't treat people like that. Uh, there was one point in my life in my 30s where God was doing a lot of things in my life as a young pastor, and I could feel the, the heat of affliction. And uh, so I finally, I, I went out for the neighborhood, I was walking around the block, and I had this kind of conversation with God. I said, oh, God, I understand Hebrews 12, that whom you love, you discipline and chasten. I get all that love thing. You're, you know, you're trying to show me your love, that you're loving me enough to discipline me. Can we move on to another lesson? <laughs> How do you think he responded? Uh, he turned up the heat, and I found out, I do not understand the depth of your love for me because there's more dross that needs to be burned out. So just when you think you've arrived and you tell God, I think you've burned out enough dross, he's looking down going, remember the Carpenter song, We Have Only <laughs> Just Begun? <laughs> and if you're a Gen X person or a millennial wondering, He's talking about wood, construction, what? No, it was a former, like, soft rock band, was it not? How many remember the Carpenters? I hey, praise God for you. Yeah, <laughs> anyway, I am old. Um, uh, trials force you to understand the sovereignty of God at a whole new light. Absolutely, he's in control. I mean, he'll turn up the heat in your life to test your faith, to go, you really believe in my sovereignty? That even in this, I am God? Absolutely. Uh, trials purify your faith. First Peter uh, 1, 3 to 7 says so. Uh, trials teach you about the proper priorities of life. As you read in Hebrews 11, the great faith chapter, verse 25, says those saints, they were choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Wow. 
What a way to live your life. God, I would rather be ill-treated as, as a Christian, be yelled at, screamed at, made fun of, etc., than to stand with wicked people and live a life of ease. I mean, a couple of months ago, they took me off Vimeo. Have I told you this? Have I told you this? Yeah, they took me off Vimeo. I'm like, are you kidding me? They took me off Vimeo. Why? Well, they didn't like some of the things that I preached about, like truth, <laughs> biblical truth. They don't want absolutes in a relativistic culture. So what do they do? They get rid of pastors that actually address truth. Um, and so, you know, it's like, Lord, I, I would rather not be on Vimeo and stand and teach your truth because you have other means by which to communicate the truth. I'll let you take care of that. This is that kind of thing. Um, uh, the trials lead to a heavenly reward. Uh, Jesus said, if you're persecuted, blessed are you, and I will bless you when I see you. Uh, first, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, uh, 1, 4 to 6, uh, God says he acquaints you with comfort so you can in turn comfort others. Next time you're in a trial and God comforts you, ask yourself, when I'm in with somebody grieving the loss of a son, a daughter, etc., will I, will I know how to comfort them? Absolutely you will. You can actually sit with them and say, I understand that kind of pain. I've been there. Uh, and you will have great compassion built into you. So the, the monkey on the back uh, causes you to lose your hope. Paul says, don't, don't, don't worry about the monkey. Uh, just follow hard after God. And even in these trials, uh, Demas types, hold strong to Christ. Hang on to his garment. And he, he's going to bless you greatly uh, with uh, the concept that your trial is going to lead to ultimate triumph when you see him. Paul understood trial. Uh, he talks about it in many places. Uh, his last letter to Timothy, chapter 3, if you back up a chapter, verse 10, he says this. He says, but you, Timothy, you followed me in my teaching, my conduct, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my perseverance, my persecutions. You were there with me. You were there with my sufferings, plural. Such as happened to me at, remember Antioch? Remember Iconium? Remember Lystra? What persecutions I endured? And notice the positive outlook. And out of them all, the Lord delivered me. He didn't say, oh, woe is me. He said, no, God was there to deliver me. Could you imagine actually telling another Christian, follow my conduct, follow my patience. Are you kidding? You can't even get out of the parking lot with being impatient, right? <laughs> no, you first. No, you go. No, we should all just be sitting there for hours waiting for the other person to go as Christians, but too convicting. We're moving back to the sermon. So he says, you follow, you follow me in all these things, but you follow me in my sufferings and my persecutions. Antioch, remember first missionary journey where, where they, uh, the Jews didn't like me teaching in the synagogues about the, a former rabbi, the, the Christ is Missioch, the anointed one. Remember, they yelled and screamed at me and called me names. Remember how those people, he says, followed me over to Iconium, did the same thing, whipped the Jews into a frenzy. They're yelling and screaming at me. And then when I went to Lystra to teach about the gospel of Jesus, the risen Messiah, they, they stoned me and drug me outside of the city and left me for dead, thought I was dead, but I wasn't dead. God delivered me from that. What, what a mindset. He, in fact, he goes back to these cities, does he not? What courage. This is an amazing man. Uh, don't tell me that uh, God doesn't use trials. He, he guides them to triumph because in your trials, he has many purposes he wants to fulfill in your life. The devil's going to tell you these have no purposes. God says, no, I'm doing great things in your life. So just ask God, God, what are you teaching me? And he should show you. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is in relationship to trials leading to triumph is trials sometimes have a very precise contextual perspective, as you see here in this passage. He says, for I, I don't consider the present sufferings of this present time, they're not worthy to be compared with what? The glory to be com uh, that, that is going to be revealed to us. It's, it's a glory that exists now ontologically, but I can't see it, but it's there, and one day I'm going to see it. This is too exciting. This could be like, we could talk till four o'clock this afternoon. We won't because there's a game. But <laughs> think about it. He says, uh, when I, and he uses the Greek word here, legisomai, which means to, it's a, uh, it's a counting term. When I look at all the facts and add them all up and look at trials and suffering, the glory of God, and I put them on a scale, bam, uh, the glory just outweighs the trials. I mean, they're basically nothing compared to glory. This is his perspective of what lies ahead. And he calls it the glory, not a glory. So he uses the article the. It's not indefinite a. You follow? We have to have some grammar in a sermon or it's not a sermon, correct? Amen. Amen. The front row is, is, thank you for being with me. How about the back row? Grammar. Yeah, thank you. One person. Praise God for you. Um, the glory. Well, what's so significant about that? Well, if you ever took, I took six years of Greek. 
Uh, and one of the things we had to do is learn how to classify the article the. Are you kidding me? That's what you do in grad school. Uh, and so there was many classifications for the article the. This would be, in my estimation, the monadic use of the article, meaning one and only. So when you say, I'm going to see the glory. What glory am I talking about? The glory of God Almighty. There's nothing like it in the whole world. Uh, God gave us a taste of the glory, Exodus 24, verse 16, tabernacle, to build the first worship structure. It says the glory of God, the Shekinah glory, the kavod of God, the Hebrew, rested on Mount Sinai, and the, and the cloud covered it for six days, and on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. So before he fills the tabernacle, later, he comes and rests upon Mount Sinai. I grew up in the desert. I mean, where I grew up in Southern California, on the border between Mexico and the United States, in the Imperial Valley, was Mount Signal. It straddled our two countries. I've, I've walked there before. It's 16 miles from El Centro to Mount Signal. Uh, you don't see clouds often in the desert. To see them gather around one mountain is odd. <laughs> you know what I mean? And to see them pulsating with light, equally odd. And it just kind of rested there for six days, and then God spoke out of the midst of the cloud. Why did the cloud bank have to be there? Because if God would have come down in his glory, the brilliance of his presence would have vaporized everybody. Thick cloud bank. Exodus 40, verse 34, when the God uh, fills the temple, it says in verse 34, the cloud covered the tent of meaning, and the glory of God filled the tabernacle. Imagine that day when his glory filled the temple. Paul says, uh, one day I'm going to see the glory, the glory of God Almighty. Uh, it leads you to ask, well, it leads me to ask, when? I mean, when will you see the glory? Uh, well, three times are possible, depending on uh, well, a variety of factors. When will you see the glory? Number one, uh, at, as a believer, at the moment of death, you shall see the glory instantly. How do I know that? Um, because 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says so. What does he say? I've used this at many funerals, uh, this passage. It's a great passage. He says for, in verse 1, For we know, in first, 2 Corinthians 5, For we know that if our earthly tent, your body, uh, which is our house is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands. Where is it? It's eternal in the heavens. Remember, a tent, it, it, it falls apart. Isn't your body falling apart? Amen. Be honest. <laughs> not me. I mean, yeah, it's always going to be this muscular. No, it's not. It's going to drop everything. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, back to my sermon. It's too convicting. Uh, he says, "For if, indeed in this house we, we groan. We're looking for the temple of a body that replaces the tent of a body, but in this physical body we groan. Why? Older you get, the harder it is to tie your shoes, is it not? Can you see your shoes? <laughs> Lose your flexibility. Uh, I mean, I was playing the piano the last service. I forgot my piano glasses. I started in the wrong key. Freaked Darren out. I mean, but there's grace in this church. The service, I have my piano glass. That's why my eyesight's 2,800. I groan all the time. Anyway, enough of sharing from my life. He says, uh, we, in this, we groan longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. No kidding. Uh, and as much as we having put it all on shall not be found naked when we die. For indeed, while we are in this tent of a body, we groan. Yes, I agree. Being burdened because we don't want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, put on this new body. In order that the mortal may be swallowed up by life eternal. That's what he's talking about. Now he, God, who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. The Holy Spirit's with you as a promise that one day you'll see the glory. That's what he's saying. Therefore, being always of good courage, which is a word for hope, and knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. What happens when I'm absent from the body? Present with the Lord. Why, how do I know that? Because that's what he says in the rest of the passage. If I'm in, in this body of a tent as it decays, well, I'm not in God's presence. But when I draw my last breath, what do I see? I see the glory of God. I see the glory of God. When I was with Liz's twin sister when she passed away in 1993 at 33 years old, I've told you this story before. I drove down the state of California, Scripps Hospital, walked in to see uh, uh, Mary Beth. And uh, she was uh, 33 on the in, in the middle of her bed, Indian style, waiting there for us to arrive. I literally walked in and she said, Marty, will you pray for me? Because I'd led her to Christ uh, the year before. I said, absolutely, I'll pray for you. Uh, I prayed for her. She then said, I think I need to lay down. Uh, she turned around and died instantly. She waited for us to get there. I looked at Liz in that room and I said, 
I wonder what Mary Beth sees now. I wonder. Well, she saw the glory, did she not? When? At the moment of death. Because that's what Paul sees. Says we shall see. Uh, talk about hope. That's why you can face death itself and have great hope because you as a believer knows what lies ahead. The old hymn puts it this way. When all my labors and trials are over and I'm safe on that beautiful shore, just to be near the Lord that I adore shall be, well, through the ages glory for me. You know, when I was a high school youth pastor in San Diego years ago, uh, I got this question all the time. Hey, Pastor Marty, what are we gonna do in heaven? And it was always kind of like, are you saying it's gonna be boring? Mm, yeah, kind of sounds boring. That's what the high school students said, you know? What am I gonna do there? Like listen to the angels sing all day or something? And, you know, you know, and day and night, I mean, what? And I told them, hey, let me explain it to you. So I gave them all the things that would happen when they would see God uh, and, and educate them on the greatness of what light uh, was, was ahead for them. And, and one of the things I told them is, would it not be enough just to stand for like 10,000 years and just stand in awe at the pulsating brilliance of the presence of God Almighty? I mean, would that not be okay? If you see me doing that, don't bother me. <laughs> Say, hey, Marty, come on, we got stuff to do. I mean, okay, I, we got time, you know. Uh, you'll see the glory. When will you see it? It's a test. No, when will you see it? Not how long. At the moment of death, if you're a believer. Uh, if you're not a believer in Christ, you're not going to see the glory because he punishes those who reject him. That's another message. Number two, uh, you will see the glory of Christ if you're alive at the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. That's a whole other message. And I've written a paper on it. If you want a copy of it, I've given you like the 19 reasons why there's a rapture. Uh, so I won't articulate all those since it's late. Praise God, right? Thank you. Uh, well, how do I know there's a rapture of the church? Well, because the scriptures teach it all over the place. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. Paul says this, but we uh, do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. That's a euphemism in Greek for death. He's speaking about Christians who've died. That you may not grieve as the rest who do not have hope, thinking that the dead loved Christians, say, the dead loved ones are going to miss the, the glory of God. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Uh, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive when this happens that the remaining and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep for the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and then we who are alive will remain to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air thus we will be always with the Lord there's a vast difference between the second coming of Christ at the end of the tribulation and the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. And I could spend hours explaining it to you, but simply put, uh, according to Zechariah 12 through 14, when the Messiah returns at the second coming for the day of the Lord, his feet touch the Mount of Olives. He touches the planet and comes here to establish his kingdom. In the rapture of the church, you don't see Jesus touching ground. We go up to meet him in the air uh, for the bride to be wedded, as it were, to the groom Jesus. Uh, when could that happen? You're thinking certainly not before game time. Uh, yes, it totally could. Would it not be better? You got to think about it. Uh, there's a doctrine called the doctrine of imminence. The doctrine of imminence means that there's not one thing that has to happen before Jesus appears. It means it, it could happen at any time. How do I know that? Uh, well, I'll give you a couple reasons. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 5. Paul says, let your forbearing spirit, spirit be known to all men. Why? Lord is near. Hadn't the Lord just died around 33 AD? This is only, you know, 15 to 20 years later, and he's telling you the Lord is near. I would put it to you this way. If he believed that the Lord was near to come back then for his church, how close are we today? Nearer? <laughs> Nearer? Uh, how about Titus chapter 2, verse 13? Looking for the blessed hope. What's the blessed hope of the believer? The appearing of the, of, of the glory, not a glory, the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're looking for that in the time of, of, of Paul. Now, what I like is James chapter 5. Notice what he says. James, don't you hate this? <laughs> uh, James says, look, 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 you believers, learn to be patient. Oh, yeah, right. Be patient, therefore, brethren, until when? Until the, the coming of the Lord. Behold, the, he's going to give you an illustration. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, doesn't he? 
throws a seed out there and then stares at it. Uh, being patient about it until he gets early and late rains that germinates the seed. Uh, he says, you too be patient, strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is, is how far away? At hand. Uh, do not complain. Oh, that's another hard one. Try to get through the day without complaining. Do not complain, brethren, against one another that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge Jesus is where? Standing at the door. The door of what? Well, there's a door between these dimensions. You can study about it in, uh, I think it's uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, where John leaves Patmos and is taken through the door into the heavenly dimension to the throne room of God. Um, Jesus is at the door waiting to open it 2,000 years ago. How close are we to him opening that door today? Uh, anytime. Nothing has to happen. In fact, the doctrine of imminency is the, is the doctrine to follow concerning the return of Christ because at the second coming of Christ, at the end of the tribulation, is... So it's predictable to a point. How so? It's another discussion. But of those 21 judgments in the book of Revelation that happen in sequential order, in the middle of the tribulation, we know from Jesus in Matthew 24 that in the middle of the seven-year period is when the Antichrist desecrates the rebuilt temple. You could calculate the coming of Christ if you saw that. We've got three and a half years until Jesus appears. That doctrine of imminency uh, completely blows that away because that could not be the second coming because you could calculate it. And so when do you see Jesus? At the moment of death or if you're alive in the coming of the Lord, if you hear a trumpet from up there, you're out of here, right? And then the last place, uh, the third time you would see the, the rapture or see the presence of God, the glory of God, is at the end of the tribulation. If you happen not to be a believer when the tribulation starts and you get saved in the tribulation, and if you live through the tribulation and you're not martyred, you will see the glory of God. How do I know? Jesus said you would. Matthew 24. The Olivet Discourse, verse 29. But immediately after the tribulation of seven years, of those days the sun will be darkened. He's going to turn off the luminaries. Black as black could get. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. The powers of the heaven will be shaken. And then when it's that dark, the sign of the Son of Man shall appear in the sky. What's going to be the sign? The, the glory will show. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Why will they mourn? Because they will realize they rejected the Messiah. And then they will see the Son of Man, Jesus, uh, coming on the clouds of the sky. And you can see the clouds because they're illuminating the glory of God. Coming with the clouds of the sky with great power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. And they'll gather together his elect from the four winds, from one of the end of the sky to the other. And he's going to divide the sheep and the goats. And the sheep will walk into the messianic kingdom with him. Whole nother topic. Job security for like 30 years. But you'll see the glory if you happen to be in the tribulation and you live to the end of it. You will see the luminaries turned off by God Almighty and against that black backdrop will be the glory of God. And when the lost see it, they mourn because they've rejected him and it's too late. But to the saved, it's like, thank you, Lord. I wonder what that day will be like when you see that glory. I mean, your first day in heaven when you're walking streets of gold, but then they're translucent and you see the, the rainbow around the throne of God and you hear the seraphim chanting, holy, holy, kadosh, kadosh is the Lord, Adonai. When you hear that, I mean, what will you see, sense, smell, hear, etc.? I mean, what that day will be like. 